It's wonderful to be with you guys. The province that I grew up in, the only one with a surname, KwaZulu Natal. Um, and it's really wonderful to be back here. And I promised my wife that I wouldn't speak about Cape Town, because when you come from Cape Town, everybody tells you about the mountain. Is that right? Yeah. So we're going to start with Acts 13 and verse 22. But last night as Dan was ministering, I really felt the Lord say to me, to be equipped, we need to be stripped. So the, the stuff that is there from stopping you from being equipped needs to go first. And I think Jared Gerrit, is that a Gerrit? You always confuse me because like everybody in my congregation is Gerrit. But, and also something that I used to always learn and something I always spoke was that we need to unlearn before we can learn. We need to get all that old stuff out, that stuff that is traditional and those things that hold us back because we think, what are they doing? Well, like we were having worship today and, and people were really going for it and you may be standing at the back thinking, what are they doing? Now, well, you need to unlearn that so that you, you can begin to participate in what God has for you. Title of my message, How to Be a Man After God's Heart. Uh, Acts 13 and verse 22. I, I was reading through Acts and I came across the scripture and I was like, Lord, you've never opened it to my eyes like you are today. And it starts off by saying, after removing Saul, that's quite hectic. You're going to be removed. If you don't behave, you're going to be removed. He made David their king, and God testified concerning him. Don't you want God to be testifying about you? Don't you want to be him to be speaking and say, that there, that, that's a woman after my own heart, or that's a, a man after my own heart? I, I hope that at the end of my days, which is closer than a lot of you, um, God will speak that over my life. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And then this end part, he will do everything I want him to do. So t today I'm, I'm hoping you're going to be challenged about the things you haven't done that God's called you to do. I, I, I really trust that uh, you're sitting here and you're thinking, you're already starting to think. And that's what I'm provoking you to do is to begin to think, Lord, that is the thing that I should have done that I haven't done. And begin to trust God that God's going to break off whatever stopped you from doing that so that you can participate in what he has called you to do. So the first thing you, you read about Saul was he was competitive in, in 1 Samuel 18, 6 to 9. You all, I'm not going to read the whole scripture, but you all know the scripture where they come back from battle and the ladies are singing about Saul. Saul has killed his thousands. And uh, then they're singing about uh, David. He has killed his tens of thousands. Now, isn't, isn't that the, the, the time that that competitive thing comes into your heart? You know, you're leading worship and you think you're doing really well. And then the next session, the, another guy gets up and you think, no, that guy's doing better than I did. But, and you know what? Competitive and insecurity because he was insecure. But I'm the king. You know what? If Russell played this part, he could play this part. Say, listen... I've been a part of starting this thing. I've, I've been into this uh, equip for, not equip, this region for so many years. And so I can preach all the messages. But I want to tell you, having been, uh, what can I call it? I was realigned into Josh Chen when, by Russell when I came down there. So I've known him for a long time. And I've, I've learned to, to appreciate what he has done in my life. Because I left Benoni, where Dan took over from me, and uh, when you've led a church, a church, not a congregation, you think you are the Pope. You, you, are, the, you are the man. And so you can make any decision that you like. 
And so coming down to Josh Jen and coming alongside Russell and seeing Russell actually supporting Andrew, it, was, it made it easier for me to begin this journey and not be insecure and not be competitive. And the thing is, you know what? When, when you are in that place, God opens doors for you. God provides opportunities. So Saul was threatened because he thought, how can others do this better than me? If you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, I could do better than Roland, I want you to hang on to that thought because I'm going to give you a chance to repent and come right <laughs> at the end. <laughs> and so they received more recognition than him. And I've, I've found, what I've found is that when comparison slips in, even in I can do children's ministry better, any, anywhere, if comparison uh, kicks into place, then you begin to perform because now you've got to do better than the person that you are comparing yourself to. And the bad thing about that is leads to disunity. And disunity, we all know that if we want God's blessing, we need to live under in a place of unity. We, we can't be in a place of disunity. And you see at the end of that scripture, it says, And Saul eyed David. That word eyed, do you know what it means? It means he was jealous. He was jealous of David. How many people have fallen because they find themselves in that place of jealousy? Really, I, I, I'm staying with Rob and Val, and I, I'm like, I'm co coveting the bed that I'm sleeping, and it's so beautiful. It's so soft, and I'm, I'm, how can I get this thing back to Cape Town? <laughs> oh. Yeah, we, we, you can come visit the mountain, bring the bed with you. <laughs> but it's, it's been so wonderful to be with you guys. It really has. Um, don't you find it a wonderful thing when, you, when your heart connects with someone? You don't have to talk too much. but you, well, Men don't talk too much. Val and Patsy talk much more than <laughs> me and Rob speak. Is that right, Rob? Well, Rob's normally out running anyway, and I'm definitely not doing that. So... <laughs> But we need to be those. We, we can't allow insecurities to motivate us to act in a bad way. Instead, insecurity, you know what you must allow to do? You must allow insecurity to drive you to God. Hey, Lord, I'm feeling insecure. That person is doing a much better job than I can do. And I'm coming to you and I'm laying it down. I'm asking you to deal with this in my life. You know what, in 1 Samuel 15, 25, Saul speaks and he says, Now I beg you, speaking to the Lord, forgive my sin and come back with me. Uh, talking to Samuel, sorry. Forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. Do you know what? Have, if, you, if you've read through Saul's life, he never worships once. Not once. Never worships, says he's going to do it, but he never ever does. But you see David in 2 Samuel 6 and verse 14, we often laugh about the scripture where it says, Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. I think we were having a good, good piece of that today in the front yet. It was getting quite hot, but it, 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 was, it was really good. And while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of tru trumpets, when David was under pressure, and I want to exhort you to do this, when David was under pressure, he worshipped. I know when, when we started the church in Nelspreet and Dan was a part of that, he was only this big, but he, he was a part of that. My children were very much a part of that church plant. They would go to school. We would have birthday parties. People would come to the birthday parties. They would get saved. That was our biggest form of outreach was our three sons. It was unbelievable. How, how that happened. And then we went into Burevos roles 
on a Sunday evening. Guys, there were guys coming for Burevos roles that I didn't even know, but they got saved. Not, not the first time, maybe the second or the third time. When you're under pressure, worship, and I, I used to, we stayed in this tiny little house, uh, Dan and my two boys, they actually lived in like a cupboard, that's how small it was. There, were, there was a triple bunk, because you couldn't have a double bunk, and there was too small, and you would, it, I, I really thought it was a cupboard, but that was their problem, not mine. And, and I, 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 I had a big I, we actually had a big room with an ensuite, and, and so uh, I, I would. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't have reminded him because now he's going to tell me more often. I think he had forgotten about that. Yeah, oh, in, in the cupboard, Dad. <laughs> so, guys, when you're under pressure, worship. You know what? Worship's not music and jumping around, worship's, yeah. In your heart, Lord, I worship you in spite of the situation. You know, that, that's what they did with Israel. When they were going out to battle, they put Judah out there in front. And they worshipped, and the enemy coming against them fell down and died most of the time. Be those that worship. Be those that worship. Don't say you're going to worship, and you don't. Don't do that. So Saul in 1 Samuel 15 and verses 20 to 23, speaking, he, he's always in trouble. He doesn't listen. But I did obey the Lord, Saul says to Samuel. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agad their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God. Be careful what you devote to God if he doesn't want you to devote it. In order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgad. But Samuel says to him, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Because you see, he had been told to go and totally annihilate them. And in another book of the Bible, it actually Samuel says to him, what's that bleating sound I can hear in the back? He's supposed to have wiped them out, but he didn't. He went and he fought. And if you, if you look at that story, uh, Samuel actually said to him, wait, and I will do the sacrifice. Because he, he was the, the prophet, the priest. And, but he, he sees the Philistine army coming and he's getting afraid. So he thinks, no, let me do the sacrifice because when I do that, we will win. And so he does that. And at, at that time, as Samuel speaks to him, he says, today, the kingdom of Israel has been taken away from you. Today. Because of disobedience. Disobedience. He didn't kill everyone and everything as God commanded him. That's amazing. We would think, oh. But when God gives a command, you do it. You do it. So, for me, Paul lived in partial obedience. And guys, I think, I think this is really a place that Christians often find themselves and they don't even know it. You think you've done everything that God told you to do, but actually you haven't. And now Maloney's going to come in. <laughs> so I'm still on Revelation and I was reading this morning and um, this scripture just stood out for me uh, it says they will make war on the lamb and the lamb will conquer them for his lord of lords and king of kings and those with him are called and chosen and faithful so now I just had to go look at the New Living Translation because Dan's, Dan's inspired me. It says, together they will go to war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And his called and chosen and faithful ones will be with him. Called, chosen, and faithful saints with him as he conquers. When I heard... Bolani shared that this morning in the prayer meeting. How about this? You called, 
You're chosen, but you haven't been faithful. So all the calling and all the choosing means nothing if you're not faithful. You've got to live in that place of not, that's partial obedience. In Acts 2.38, it says, repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if you're sitting here this morning and you've got saved, you've repented, but you haven't been baptized yet, you're living in partial obedience. If you haven't received the Holy Spirit, if you, because people, uh, they resist the Holy Spirit, you are living in partial obedience. And it's such a, for me, I'd rather somebody not saved at all than someone living in partial obedience. Because they're living there thinking that everything's okay, but actually there are some things that need to change in their life. The command was not to spare anything. Not to spare anything. If God speaks to you, if there are issues in your life that need to be dealt with, don't, don't deal with two out of three. Deal with three out of three. Make sure that you have dealt with it all. Partial obedience is not good enough. The other thing that uh, Saul often did was he blamed others. He he didn't take ownership of what he had done. He says in 1 Samuel 15, 20, he says, But I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission. Not true. He didn't finish what Samuel had asked him to do from the Lord. So then, in, uh, I haven't put the scripture down, 1 Chronicles 21, 17, we have the story of David when he says, let's take a census of the nation. Let's count all the fighting men. I don't know why he did that, but he, he did it. And Israel is, God is starting to wipe Israel out killing Israelites. And David goes before the Lord and he says, Lord, please, it's not their fault, it's my fault. He takes ownership. He acknowledges this is my problem. It's not their problem. And we need to be like that. We really do. 1 1 Chronicles 21 and verse 17, let, let me just read it. Was it not I who ordered the fighting men to be counted? I, the shepherd, have sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Lord, my God, let your hand fall on me and my family, but do not let this plague remain on your people. Who does that later for all of us? Jesus, hanging on the cross. He says, Lord, forgive them. Uh, I'll take this. I'll take it for them. Forgive them. And then you, are, you got the story, everyone knows that in 2 Samuel 12, where, where uh, David has Uriah killed, Uriah, for Bathsheba. And Nathan comes to him and speaks to him about these sheep and this little sheep that lives amongst these sheep and what you have been doing. And David just says, Lord, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I cannot live in this place. So when David is confronted he repents but then this morning just thinking about repentance in Romans I think it's Romans 2 where God says through the word my kindness leads to repentance what what does he mean by that for me kindness is that he's made a way for me to deal with this problem and so in, in Acts 3.19, one of my really favorite scriptures, repent then, turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come. Times of refreshing. God, I, that's where I want to live, in that place of being refreshed all the time, not a- allowing it to wash the world's dirt off me as it were. Uh, and, and you live there by being a person that lives in a place of repentance. Lord, I am sorry what I did. I, I find it very strange how many Christians actually struggle to repent. They struggle. 
no, I didn't do that, like Saul. Or I should have done that, but I did this, and that should be okay. No, you know what? When God gives you a way, you do it his way, not your way. You do it his way. So Paul, Saul, he, Saul starts well. He starts as this young man. It says that he was head and shoulders above the rest. He stood out from those around him. He starts well, and yet he dies in the occult. He commits suicide. In, in 1 Samuel 16, 14, it says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. And then 1 Chronicles 10, 13, it says, Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. So Milani's word, faith. Unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord. How much more should we keep the word than him? Because we've got the complete word. And even consulted a medium for guidance. This is the guy that God put in place. So, this is the hectic part. So the Lord put him to death. I don't know what your theology is on that. Mine is, the Lord opened a way for the devil to come in and kill him. It says the previous one, the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. Let's go back to that very first scripture, Acts 13 and verse 22. After removing Saul, after removing Saul, guys, I don't want to be the person that God's removing. Let's not find ourselves in the place of being removed. He made David their king. Let's be like that guy. And how do we be like David? It says God testified, first of all. Testify, if you're a lawyer, they'll tell you that you have to be an eyewitness. You can't be something that uh, you've heard about and maybe not seen yourself. You need to be an eyewitness, somebody who's actually seen. So in your life with God, you need to be seeing what God is doing and how he's working. As uh, Herod spoke about the fact that uh, we only need to bring our little bit and God will do his big bit. And then he says, after, as he testifies, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And he says, he will do everything I want him to do. So if you think about that, David had a man killed, and he took his wife. Do you think God asked him to do that? What did God ask him? He said, repent. Repent. Put that thing right with me. So God is asking you this morning, if there are things in your heart that you know are getting in the way of your relationship with God, I want God to come this morning. And I, I know people don't like to respond to this message because they're looking at the person on their left and on their right and they're thinking, ooh, they're going to they're gonna see that I'm standing. Don't be like Saul. Not partial obedience, full obedience. This morning, God wants to set you free. He wants to bring you into a place of refreshing. For me, refreshing speaks of the Holy Spirit coming, ministering to me. My, one of my favorite topics is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And some, something that I learned from Sam, Sam many years ago, because I always say the Holy Spirit, and Sam would say, Holy Spirit. I've got a relationship with Holy Spirit, not the Holy Spirit. And so I had to go and sort that out, and I actually heard... Derek Paulson, David Paulson actually speak about the fact when you put the 
Holy Spirit, it's an act of the Holy Spirit. When you speak of relationship, it's Holy Spirit. And so I, I, I want to pray for you guys. If, if you're feeling a storm morning, uh, haven't been that long. If, if you're still feeling that you are there and you want to be drenched with the Holy Spirit today, I wonder if you'll jump up. Jump up. That's it. Jump up.